Good afternoon and welcome to Broadcast in Scotland's special programme for On Brexit. My name's Corey Wilson and I'm joined this afternoon by Maggie Lennon. Welcome Maggie. Thank you, glad to be here. Um, in a wee while we'll be going live to um, Mike Russell's speech in Holyrood, but before that we're just going to have a bit of a chat about what's been going on in the last couple of days. <laughs> um, so obviously we've had um, the deal signed yesterday Indeed. and Theresa... <coughs> statement last night said that collectively they had agreed but it doesn't seem that that's the case this no morning. exactly and you can't help thinking the whole thing's been a wee bit stage managed because had they said last night we're not going to let you mm. go out there and say we've got a deal there had been no charade of this in parliament today so it feels like they've done it in order to give her a sort of day in court as it mm. were um, they didn't just all go home last night and have a wee think to themselves mm. and, and pen their letters. So the whole thing's been stage managed. And I think that's just another example of the British public being just lied to and deceived mm. and we're getting heartily sick of it. And I suspect there are even a lot of people who voted leave who are getting heartily sick of it. Yeah. So, you know, the, the Chinese have, an inter have a phrase and they say to you, may you live in interesting times, but it's actually meant as a curse. Right. And what worries me is that mm. these interesting times are going to come back to haunt us in Scotland and yeah. this is going to be a moment decisive action has to be taken or we are really going to rue this day. Mm -hmm. I think um, some of the, the feedback that was coming back from meeting last night appeared to be a very heated cabinet meeting. It did last five hours. Um, so you're right in what you're saying. Why was that not addressed at that time? But instead they sent her out and then this morning we've had... Do you think we're going to see more resignations before the day's out? Yeah, I would think so. Although um, Liam Fox has come out and said he won't resign and Michael Gove has come out and said he won't resign, but I think there'll be some others, definitely. Um, Mandel, of course, is the one we're all waiting for, the big scalp. He's trying to deny, apparently, that he mm -hmm. ever said he would resign, yeah. but his name is on the letter. Um, but he's also seems to be saying that he'll stay put. So, But I think there'll be some others, um, at maybe more junior ministers uh, than big cabinets. Mm -hmm scalps. Um, it will depend I suppose what happens with the um, letters asking for her to stand down that we mm. understand are, are being submitted as we speak but obviously we don't know. Yeah, It doesn't say much for um, Mundell or Ruth Davison's credibility really when they specifically said that they would they would resign if this deal was quint you know contradicted anything for Scotland and it didn't help Scotland and now it, it seems like they're back or, in, or indeed all 13 Tory MPs yeah, who yeah. said that if fishing was at risk and it appears that someone has said in Europe today that the current deal will mean that fishing is not protected in Scotland so once again the Conservative Party have sold out the Scottish fishermen mm -hmm. and you know I don't have any patience with people who say well you know they re put their sword that's people's livelihoods yeah. at stake and and you know they need protected so um, it would appear that all the red lines that have come out of the Tory party in Scotland have been happily crossed today and nobody's planning to do mm -hmm. anything about it doesn't really surprise me about Mundell he's not exactly what you'd call politician of conviction um, and Ruth Davidson I suppose will just be able to hide behind their maternity leave at the moment and say, well, I'm not really not really in the game. Mm. So we'll wait and see, but I don't think we'll see either of them go. Yeah. I think you're right about the, the fishing and, and farming as well to that extent. Now, obviously, you know, a lot of them voted no in 2014 because they thought that was the right thing to do. Um, but I think they're probably both sectors are beginning to think that you know, maybe they were sold. Yeah, my, I have family who live in the northeast of Scotland, so I'm hearing when I'm up there visiting mm -hmm. um, that, you know, amongst people that they know who were pretty solidly no voters, that there is a change of heart. So, mm -hmm. and that's obviously the heartland that we need that. And and women, women of my age who were also um, uh, unsure, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm on the National Committee of Women for Independence, so that's our target demographic. Yeah. And um, we, like lots of organisations, are really gearing up now because we need some leadership on what comes next. And mm. you don't know what Mike Russell's going to say. I doubt he's going to say anything particularly new today. Mm -hmm. um, Nicola Sturgeon is speaking at our AGM on Saturday in Perth. Mm -hmm. It's going to be an interesting Q&A session because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there's only going to be one topic on the table. And yeah. we're we're writing our Who Manifesto at, at the moment, just our demands for what needs to happen for women in Scotland, both within the current constitutional setup and with an independent Scotland. So we need to start having serious discussions about when? Mm -hmm. Because we've talked about red lines. Well, a lot of Nicola's red lines have been crossed. She's got the mandate. It really is time that we start mm -hmm. using it. Yeah. I think um, in terms of the, the agreement that was that was published, um, 
there was an absolute furore on social media yesterday when it was discovered that Scotland didn't appear to be mentioned once, Not once. in the whole document. And what I haven't been able to find out, I believe there are 3,000 um, geographical protections for um, produce mm -hmm. in the agreement. Um, I don't know if Scotch whisky has been mentioned, um, because obviously there's a big hoo-ha at the moment mm -hmm. about... Marks and Spencer selling yeah. British whisky. Uh, Welsh lamb, however, is protected. Mm -hmm. I think that's only the one mention of Wales in the document, but again, they can't really complain. They voted to leave. But I think it's not just that there wasn't a mention of Scotland. We're now hearing that Gibraltar mm -hmm. saw the, 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 document. the document, if not the full document, at least most of it. The DUP certainly did. And there's a suggestion that some big business owners saw it as well. Mm -hmm. And yet Scotland didn't see it, and she refused point blank to discuss with the First Minister of Scotland, what was in the deal before she spoke to Cabinet. I don't know how much more disrespect from Westminster has to happen before someone in the Scottish Government says enough, because activists are saying enough. And I'm frightened that we lose the moment. And, and someone said to me today that the real fear is that this becomes normalised, that this mm. just disrespecting Scotland and we go back into our box and we just go, well, that's the way we're treated. And we were so away from that attitude in 20, 2014. We really can't afford not to be back back in the game. Yeah. I don't think um, anybody, I mean, obviously there's the, the, the what appears to be the special deal for Northern Ireland, and I don't think anybody would be against that. Not at all. Um, you know, but I think what particularly the First Minister has been very clear about is that she wants to protect Scotland. Absolutely. And, and that's got to be crucial to... Absolutely. And, and, you know, we've been here before with special deals for Northern Ireland. They're they were going to be quite happily be given a much lower rate of corporation tax to keep mm -hmm. them in line with the Republic. And yet when we wanted the same in Scotland, we were told, no, no, that's a race to the bottom, you can't have it. So um, it's not that we don't want Northern Ireland to get the special mm -hmm. treatment, we certainly don't want the return to the violence, but we just want Scotland to get the same because we voted to remain as well. Um, and it's the unfairness of that, I think. Um, and it's very, it's ridiculous. There are some unions commentators today out there in social media trying to take Nicola Sturgeon to task for daring to pretend she doesn't understand the reasons for the special uh, deal for Northern Ireland. It's not that at all. No one is trying to use the peace dividend in any way other than just say, you know, what's sauce for the goose has to be sauce for the gander. Um, but clearly they don't give a, a, a monkeys about Scotland, our position, our feelings. They're just going to ride Russia over us. We're not hearing enough about the powers that are being repatriated to Westminster. Mm. Outside of the indie bubble, no one's talking about that. This has all now got to come out into the wider social media and the wider media. It's difficult when your media is opposed to you, on the whole, but people have got to know that that's happening. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, in terms of... You, you, we don't want Scotland to be at a disadvantage because if... If Northern Ireland's got a special deal and that can attract businesses... Thank you very much. The to... next item of business oh, this think... afternoon is a statement by Michael Russell but on an update from the Scottish Government on Michael the proposed live UK now. EU withdrawal agreement and political declaration. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, so anybody who wishes to ask a question, I would urge them to press their request to speak button as soon as possible, and I call on the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, and I'm grateful for the opportunity at this important moment in the Brexit process to update the Chamber. Though, given the speed of current developments, I'm not confident I'll be able to cover everything or that things will have not have changed again before I sit down. However, at the outset, let me say I make this statement with a heavy heart. Scotland voted to stay in the EU in June 2016 by 62% to 38%. To be dragged out of the EU against our will is democratically wrong, and will be deeply resented by many in this country. Those of us who regard ourselves as Europeans and Scots, and whose life experience has been embedded in that identity, will feel particularly sad and sore. Now, no doubt there are others who will rejoice at what is taking place, and I respect their view. But it is fair to note that the experience of Brexit and the demonstration of Tory incompetence over the last two years has not only resulted in a growing number of those who wish to remain in the EU, but also in a diminution in those who are in any way persuaded by the empty bluster of the Conservative Party in Scotland on these matters. Today's polls tell that story. I believe a future election would confirm it. But this is a sad day nonetheless, a day in which spin, rhetoric, the misuse of funds and the manipulation of electoral legislation have led to the worst and most damaging decision made by a UK government in any of our lifetimes. A day in which the UK government has attempted, voluntarily 
and for its own selfish political purposes to actually lower the standard of living for all the citizens of Scotland and to distance itself from the global benefits of the world's largest free trade bloc. The Prime Minister last night described this proposed agreement as the best that could be obtained in the circumstances. But what a difference a day makes, particularly to circumstances. Her deal was the inevitable result of a series of self-imposed draconian red lines, the wish to turn her back on sensible cooperation across our continent, and the loose talk and empty rhetoric of her cabinet who have shown contempt for evidence-based policymaking. And the death of her deal over the past 24 hours, for it is now essentially dead, arises from the same insularity, the same wrong-headedness, and the same arrogance. She has only herself to blame for the appalling circumstances she has found herself in. Appalling circumstances not just for her, but for all of us on these islands. Presiding officer, there's been much analysis of the deal already, despite the fact that the details are still not as clear as they should be, particularly with regard to the political declaration. But briefly, this deal, first of all, maintains a form of customs union for a period of time for all of these islands. That is in itself welcome, but because it is partial, does not include any of the advantages of the single market, and may be temporary, it is nowhere near good enough. Secondly, it makes a differentiation between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK in similar terms to those which we suggested for Scotland two years ago. Thirdly, it prepares the ground for a continuing betrayal of our fishing interests. Fourthly, it fails to guarantee key rights, human rights, environmental rights, employment rights, which we need and which we should never give up. And finally, by its language and outcomes, it continues to ignore the current devolution settlement and the democratic institutions in Scotland and Wales. Indeed, as the Prime Minister herself confirmed this morning, Scotland does not exist in her thinking about this deal. A fact very tellingly illustrated by the distinguished blogger and legal writer David Alan Green when he pointed out this morning on Twitter that the document that outlines the deal does refer to the British Antarctic Territory but makes no mention at all of Scotland. Presiding officer, in summary, this proposed deal does not meet the frequently stated Scottish Government requirement of single market and customs union membership for the whole of the UK which failing for Scotland. It does not make even a gesture towards recognising the vote of Scotland to remain does not tackle the considerable and grave problems that will be caused by Scotland coming out of the single market and customs union, it takes away the four freedoms, and in particular freedom of movement, which is essential for Scotland, and fails to address in any way the additional pressures on Scotland if its neighbour in Northern Ireland retains the advantages of single market and customs union involvement. It cannot therefore be supported by this government or by the SNP. Presiding officer, much of Scotland looks at the current state of the UK government and Brexit with astonishment and resentment. Scotland is an outward-focused European nation. We voted to remain within the European Union. It is clear that we would do so again tomorrow if a similar referendum was held. The Scottish government has been clear and remains clear that the best outcome for Scotland is to be within the EU. But, and it is a big but, that has cost the Scottish government a great deal of effort we have repeatedly tried to find a compromise position which would allow the UK government and the Scottish government to move forward, but to no avail. So what is to be done? Well, first of all, we should take some heart from a major development just this week when the leaders of all the opposition parties at Westminster, including Jeremy Corbyn and Vince Cable, took action to ensure that there will be the opportunity for other proposals to be put when the so-called meaningful vote is heard. There are many alternatives that might be considered, including the Scottish Government policy of remaining in the single market and the customs union, as well as an EEA model, remaining in the EU, as the Prime Minister herself let slip, it is an option, yesterday. So no one can argue that the choice is whatever the Prime Minister says it is. The choice will be what the people and their elected representatives say it should be. We will therefore, as a party in the House of Commons, continue to work in a constructive and common sense way with other opposition parties to try and save us from the chaos of this Tory Brexit. And I commit the Scottish Government to the same constructive working which we have tried to carry forward in this chamber with other parties during the Brexit period. But, presiding officer, not only is this a bad deal, it is being pursued in a bad way. The presentation of a totally false choice to try and bludgeon MPs and others to support the Prime Minister is one sign of that. Another is the actions of the UK government, which have sought to restrict the powers of this parliament and which have already imposed upon us legislation against our will. This is not just a bad deal because it will damage our future relationship with Europe, 
but because it also creates the pretext for a continued unconstitutional assault on the rights and privileges of the people of Scotland as exercised through this Parliament. It is an attempt to unsettle the will of the Scottish people, whilst eroding the rights of and imperiling the future prosperity of everyone who lives in this country. So, presiding officer, what is being offered is unacceptable, and so is what is not being offered. This deal provides for a degree of differentiation in Northern Ireland, which we fully support as essential to the future functioning of the Irish border and the protection of the Good Friday Agreement. We want that to happen. We will do everything we can to help it happen. And of course, whilst the deal provides for the whole of the UK to be within a customs union within the EU, thus rendering Liam Fox's job redundant at the stroke of the negotiator's pen, there will also, we understand, be specific provisions, including single market alignment provision, which will only apply to Northern Ireland. That will see a better level of access to the European market for Northern Ireland compared to other parts of the UK. We rejoice for Northern Ireland that this has been achieved, but we cannot accept it be achieved only for Northern Ireland. The Scottish Government has been arguing since December 2016 that if the UK leaves the single market, Scotland should remain. But in January 2017, within weeks of the publication of Scotland's Place in Europe, I was told to my face by David Davis in his own office in the House of Commons that differentiation could not work in these islands and would not be proposed by the UK government. But now Northern Ireland rightly is to receive that special status, yet we alone of the four nations will get nothing we voted for. England and Wales voted leave, and they will leave, even though polls now show that the majority in Wales is against, and much of England is moving that way. Northern Ireland will get a special deal. Even tiny Gibraltar, which was resolute in its need for continued special treatment, which we understood and supported, has been given that special treatment. But Scotland, with the highest Remain vote of any of the UK nations, is to be dragged out of the EU against our will, exposed to severe economic disadvantage and damage, have the powers of our Parliament diminished, and yet receive nothing at all. Enough, presiding officer, is enough. Throughout the long, tortuous process of engagement with the UK government, we have been repeatedly assured of the importance of our views, but those assurances have turned out to be worthless and hollow. So what, presiding officer, do we here in this parliament do next? Well, firstly, we should go on working with others in Scotland, in the UK, and across parties to ensure there is a better deal than the false choice offered by the UK government of this disastrous deal or no deal. An election, the people's vote, remain within that mix. We will also ensure that this Scottish Parliament has the right to give its own view on this deal. And I confirm today that the Scottish Government will bring the deal, if agreed at the Brussels summit on November the 25th, to this chamber for a vote before the vote takes place in the House of Commons. And of course our motion will be amendable. That is how a proper Parliament should work. But as I said at the beginning of this statement, Presiding Officer, this is a sad day for those of us who believe and still believe in the importance of European cooperation. Those of us who reject the demonizing of migration, the misrepresentation of cooperation, and the assertion of false claims regarding taking back control and the independence of the UK. Those of us, in other words, who still believe in a better future for our country. Of course, in one sense, we have been here before. The promises made from 2014, lead not leave, for example, have turned out to be worthless. We are not an equal partner, and the events of this week have proved it beyond peradventure. And I know that from each and every meeting of the JMC I have attended on behalf of this government. Far from leading the UK, the people of Scotland have been ignored and dismissed. Westminster has treated and goes on treating Scotland with contempt. But it does not have to be that way. It should not be that way. And I would contend that it is the duty of every elected representative in this place to make sure it isn't allowed to be that way. We should understand that politicians are, if they are anything, people with a vision of a better future, motivated by a burning desire to help our fellow citizens achieve it. Brexit isn't a better future. It's a backward step into a false and imagined past. That is now crystal clear, and every word of this deal proves it to be true. Things in Brexit, presiding officer, for Scotland can only get worse. So we must acknowledge that this deal is unacceptable to Scotland and her citizens. And we must then find a way to work together to ensure that our country is not failed by a disastrous Tory Brexit, but enabled to flourish by choosing a different way forward.
Thank you. We'll now move on to questions. Adam Tom. Russell's speech, what did you make of that? Well, uh, once yeah. again, we are seeing more statesmanship coming out of mm. Holyrood than we've seen come out of Westminster in the last 18 months. Um, there's nothing in my speech that you could disagree with. Um, uh, I think it was very measured. And we have seen him rattled in the past. I mean, there have been times when he's come out of meetings and mm. been interviewed on the street where he has looked genuinely shocked at the things that have been said to him. He gave you a bit of an indication there of a a private conversation with David Davis. Um, doesn't answer the big question. Yes, we need to find a different way forward, but what is that going to be and how is it going to be achieved and when is it going to happen? And we do need that address. Statesmanship is fine. It will stand us in good stead. Uh, I mean, Nicola's statesmanship that she displayed at the time of Brexit was you know, well documented and well received across Europe, but we need a bit of leadership now. So what's next? I think... Um you're, you're right there, and you, but you could obviously sense his almost frustration yes. and anger about the, the situation. And when he spoke about the spin and the rhetoric and the misuse of funds, it's like, you know, how how can you play that game, if you like, yes. when the other person's cheating? Yeah, I think if we, we mustn't forget that there is an illegality yeah, around this yeah. whole incident and people are not being brought to book about it. Um, so it was good to start with that, just to remind people that this whole thing stinks from its top to its toe. Um, so yeah, you, you can't play that game. You need to play another game. And it's the other game that we need to move to pretty soon, I think. Um, I did smile, though. Every cloud is a silver lining. You know, Liam Fox doesn't really have a job anymore. Maybe that's why he hasn't resigned. You know, he's out of a job anyway. Um, but yeah, there's nothing in this to, to smile at at all. I mean, there was a there was a while in the early days where I was, every time something disastrous happened, I kind of smirked and thought, well, serves you right. And then I thought, well, wait a minute, I'm going to suffer from this as well, yeah, despite the yeah. fact it's not what I want. So we can't really take that position of saying, well, that's just what you get because we're all going to suffer. So there's nothing, there's no fun in this at all. There's mm -hmm. nothing to be taken from it. Um, and I think it's good too that he was very, very strong to on the, what we want for Northern Ireland, what we want for our friends across the Irish Sea, with no question that they should not have what they've been offered. Um, and hopefully that will put to rest this rather insidious suggestion that Nicola is trying to play the, yeah, the violence card. Absolutely. And that's just not acceptable. Um, but he's made it clear we have asked for the same deal and that's the very minimum. If we're not going to get it and we're clearly not going to get it, then we need plan B. And maybe even a plan C and a plan D, but we certainly need a plan B. Plan, yeah. Um, it's it's quite ironic, really. Theresa has spent months telling us all that um, no deal would be better than a bad deal. And now, within the last 24 hours, she's trying to tell us that this, this deal is better than no deal. Than no deal. Or no Brexit at all. Well, no actually, no Brexit at all would be the best for everybody, thank you. Let's just forget the whole thing and, and, and say... No, there's no credibility whatsoever. And it's as if she forgets that the British public... Um, you know, we're, we're a reasonably politically aware nation, I think. Although it was interesting, actually, after the Brexit vote, the number of people in England who, because of their um, antiquated voting system, which is first past mm -hmm. the post for everything, and, are, and people are used to their vote not counting, that people were actually expressing surprise that it counted in a referendum. They didn't get the binary notion mm. of a referendum. You know, we're a bit more referendum-wise up yeah. here. And that amazed me that people could actually say, well, I didn't think my vote would count because it never counts. You know, There were mm. only two questions on the ballot paper. But that aside, I think we are a fairly um, savvy nation when it comes to politics. There's a lot of politics in the UK. It's as if she thinks we're just all idiots and children and bamboozled by it. And I think that's part of the aim. It's about normalising what is unnatural behaviour mm -hmm. and just thinking if they say things often enough that people will believe them or worse become so disheartened by it that they just start saying I don't care and this is not no she's the one that's good at saying this is not the time well this is not the time to stop caring this is the time to really think long and hard about the kind of future you want and take action. I think people are understandably concerned especially when there is talk around the army being deployed in the streets, there's talk around, you know, stockpiling food and medicine. You know, these are just 
Well, it's bizarre. It's, it's ironic, isn't it? Because about. the whole the whole pro Brexit narrative has been couched very much in kind of war terms, you know, mm. um, back to the Dunkirk spirit and all that complete nonsense. And actually, we are going to be moving back to the nineteen forties mm. and fifties. We will have rationing in this country. I think there's no doubt about that. Um, we are not self sufficient in food, uh, and we know that there's going to be massive holdups at the ports. And whatever. So we will go back to that position. And that's seriously not what people expected or wanted. And that Dunkirk spirit that may or may not have existed won't last for very long. You know what it's like in this country when there's bad weather for three days. People rush to the supermarkets and buy all the bread and there's no mm. food left for anybody. Well, that's what's going to happen. And I think there will be civil unrest and there will be violence, um, which I don't want to see, but I think it's inevitable. You know, I've thought for a long time that what will finally take us over the line for independence is if the Westminster government does something really stupid. Now, the Westminster government doing something really stupid is a common occurrence, but it might be something that is even provoked. And I've said for a long time, do you know what? Tanks in George Square in Glasgow, it's been done before, would be just the very thing to, to make people who really are perhaps not very political and a bit iffy about the future go, hang on a minute, this isn't the country that I mm -hmm. thought I was living in. Now, what they've done with this deal is very stupid and that might be enough to take us over the line with independence. I suspect probably not immediately. But wh however they react to what's happening in Westminster over the next few days and what will happen once... And we will crash out. I think it's now inevitable. I think it's no deal. We will crash out with nothing. Um, and I think... Uh, and there'll be no backstop for anybody. And goodness knows what will happen in Northern Ireland. Um, and then I think the, the government's reaction to that, which will have to become fairly repressive, is really going to waken people up. It's terrifying, actually. I am mm -hmm. actually really concerned. It's more than just a kind of theoretical, this will be an interesting thing to watch if you're interested yeah, in politics. Yeah. I'm actually very, very concerned for what's going to happen in this country. I am very concerned what's going to happen to migrants living in this country because there is no doubt the narrative in England mm -hmm. around Brexit was anti-foreigner. Um, and that's what I do for a living. I work with migrants and refugees and I'm really concerned for the people that I support every day that their lives are going to be made harder and they're going to be victimised. So, yeah, horrible days to come, I think. Yeah. You talked about um, food and I think it was, was early in the year we had some bad snow and the, and the shops were... We couldn't get the, the food up and the shops were practically empty. Exactly. Um, and I think Mike picked up on the point about um, this, you know, this government are actually lowering the standard of living for people. And, I mean, we've, we've seen this week the, the UN special reporter up here looking at, you know, poverty and who actually was quite complimentary about what the Scottish government doing, you know, conversely to what Westminster's mm. doing. It just seems incredible that we have so much poverty and deprivation in one of the richest countries of the world. Yes, and the actions of the current Westminster government are only going to make it worse. The UN report has been looking at um, human rights issues in the UK and mm. there's a number of violations going on that nobody really hears about if you're not sort of in that sector. And I think that's going to increase with what happens post-Brexit. Um, it's as if they just... It's as if they've set on a path in order to so demoralise the people of this country that they will just simply roll over and do nothing because we don't have a tradition of revolution mm. you know um, we had a civil war we got rid of the monarchy and then we invited them back a few years later you know we, we're not that kind of we didn't have a 1968 moment in the UK yeah. when the rest of Europe did that's not the British way that's not how we do things we've been blessed that there has been no violence attached to the independence movement in Scotland and long may that continue but I think they're just assuming that's how people are going to carry on. And I'm not convinced that is how people are going to carry on. And what worries me is if people do decide to act in a slightly different approach, what the government will do in response. They're not going to take it well. I mean, you know, the firemen went on strike, they sent in the army for heaven's sake. Mm, so I, I absolutely think you will see the army on the streets. Um, and I think you'll see the police armed more heavily. Mm. And I think once that's done, it's getting the guns back off the police yeah. is a difficult thing and just how much will we see the army in a, in a more civic role in the future and that's quite scary. I had friends staying from Berlin at the weekend and they're obviously hugely interested in the whole of this and the whole constitutional question in Scotland and they were asking what would happen if Scotland just went ahead and, and had a, an illegal or un, unallowed referendum and I said well I think that's probably what's going to happen and she said but aren't you frightened that they would do to you what they've done to people in Spain. 
And I said, listen to the question you've asked me. Mm. You're not sitting there saying it's appalling what's happening to the people in Catalonia from the Spanish government. You're just assuming that the British government would do the same to its people. That's how bad it is. And people are actually having those conversations. Would they do the same? Would they try to imprison activists? What would they do? That's just a position that, you know, two, three years ago, we would never have thought what we, that we were in. Yeah, yeah. Mike, you, you mentioned human rights and obviously Mike picked up on that, you know, as, as a number of protections that potentially we could lose and it was human rights and workers' rights. I think there has been this um, negative narrative um, over the last few months, years, um, that is about, you know, making people think that the EU is controlling absolutely everything that you're doing um, and they're making it into this negative um, frame whereby now the ordinary citizen who were voting for that, that referendum thought that, you know, this bad EU, instead of protecting us, that they were doing something bad. And that's that, that the media helped put that narrative out there. I think definitely. And I think that, I think in Scotland, I mean, we have now kind of just come up with our own declaration of human rights that mm. the Scottish Human Rights Consortium has been promoting. Um, and I think a lot of people are aware in Scotland that our law is all completely underpinned by that and by the European Court of Justice, um, which is not the same for the rest of, of the UK. And I think people in Scotland are really, really concerned about that. I mean, the whole suggestion that May was very happy to discuss while she was Home Secretary and the worst Home Secretary we've mm -hmm. ever had, I think, mm -hmm. was that we were just going to unsign or de-sign from the Human Rights Act and replace it with this UK Bill of Rights. Well, you can't impose that on Scotland. You certainly can't impose it on Northern Ireland. And that point has been made. Um, so I think people in Scotland are a bit more aware. But one of the things that I've been saying for a long time, you know, we need the campaign that says, what has the Human Rights Act ever done for us? Mm -hmm. And it's not about saying to prisoners you don't have to you know pour, pour your pee down the toilet in the morning it's yeah, actually yeah. about it's basic fundamental rights that we take for granted but you're right the media have been complicit in this along with stories of straight bananas mm -hmm, there's a website mm -hmm, i mm -hmm. found today which i thought was hysterical which is the, the eu have been archiving all the ridiculous all the myths, myths <laughs> that the British press have come up with. And they've been, they're really, if it wasn't so tragic, it would be funny. And we, we all remember the, the straight bananas one, but, you know, the yeah, human rights one's yeah. a really serious yeah, one. Yeah. Um, and I think people are not really, uh, really fully aware just how their rights are going to suffer. We know this is a government that wants to deregulate everything. There have been hard Brexiteers in Cabinet have said as much, rubbing their fat little hands and saying we'll be able to destroy workers' rights, we'll be able to get rid of the minimum wage uh, and the working time directive, um, which Britain doesn't fully sign up to in any regard. And I think that's the thing that people don't understand. Britain has a veto on a lot of EU mm -hmm. legislation, and by God, it's used it. Um, and that, So we're not bound by absolutely everything. Um, so that I think the media has been hugely complicit in this, but then that's, you know, this myth that the media reflects public opinion is a myth. I was a journalist for years. The media reflects an agenda of its political masters, and in Brexit, the, the right-wing media in England, and to some extent some of the media in Scotland, has done exactly that for them. Yeah. I mean, obviously Mike said there that, um, you know, the, the Brexit deal on the table doesn't meet the Scottish government requirements, um, and he's, he quite had categorically said that it wouldn't be supported by the government or the SNP. He referred to Scotland being an outward focused European country um, and I think that's you know completely the opposite of what Westminster's trying to tell us. Um, and he also had a nod to despite trying to compromise and I feel that with what we have heard both um, Mike and Nicola and any other, anybody else involved in the negotiations have really tried to compromise but the door's been shut in their face constantly. I think that's Nicola Sturgeon's approach generally. I mean, it's not how the media portray her, but mm. I think she is a stateswoman and I think she does go into negotiations with that view that, I mean, politics is compromise. And I think when you're in a parliament like the Scottish Parliament, which, OK, they had, a, they had a, 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 an absolute majority for a short time, but that's not really how the parliament is set up. It is a parliament about more consensus, mm. that that's your starting point. Now, 
Westminster's not. It's an adversarial ad, um, setup. I mean, just the way it's laid out, it's all about people shouting across a room at each other. I don't think Westminster know how to negotiate with anybody, no. certainly not their European um, friends at all. So I don't think they understand compromise. I mean, with Theresa, it's her way or the highway. Mm. Well, do you know, that's fine, Theresa, because we'll just get off your highway and make our own path, thank you very much. And I can't really say that the Scottish Government are faced with much other choice. Mm. There's going to have to be a decision about putting a new way forward to the Scottish people, and it's going to have to be soon. There's been talk this week about um, part of the Brexit negotiations and, and about taking you know the powers back to Westminster, that they could invoke special measures, which would be things like the army in the street and, and et cetera. But one of the, the um, dangers could possibly be that they, they take the powers away from Holyrood. Do you oh, think the, that the, is a the repeal of the Scotland Act, absolutely. Mm. I would be amazed if there's not somebody in a back room somewhere in Westminster has been looking at that. And I don't think people even realise that they have the power to do that. The Scotland Act was prepared in such a way that Scotland's not able to say, actually, mm -hmm. we've changed our mind about this, we don't really want our parliament anymore. But the Westminster parliament can. Now, they've clo effectively closed down Stormont. There will not be a devolved administration in Northern Ireland again. Either Northern Ireland will join with the South and there'll be an independent country, but they'll not be. They've done that deliberately, I think. I mean, there are lots of chances, there were lots of chances for the differences between Sinn Féin and the DUP to be resolved. Arlene Foster was the sticking block. So they've got rid of that little problem. The Welsh Assembly has a lot less power than either the Northern Ireland Assembly or the Scottish Government, and they can just choose to ignore Wales. They don't really take Wales very seriously at all. Um, the Labour Party run Wales and the Labour Party are in the Tory pockets. Scotland is the thorn in their side. And I would not be surprised if there are more powers repatriated and there is a move to suspend the Scottish Parliament at some point. And that might be if Nicola was to say, we're going to have a referendum, whether you allow us or not. Mm. Uh, and Now, that's the sort of thing I was talking about. Westminster doing something so incredibly stupid mm. that people go... Hud the bus. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, that's not mm -hmm. on. So even people I know who are fairly staunch were fairly staunch no voters, when you say to them, How would you feel if the Scottish Parliament disappeared? Once you get past the well that'll never happen attitude, they do pause and think. So it might have to and God forbid it comes to that, but it might have to take something as momentous as that to happen. And really, all bets are off. Someone on my um Twitter feed this morning said something that I thought was actually a good point. You know, the Soviet Union was there one day and pretty much gone the next. Mm. The Berlin Wall fell down fairly quickly. There have been momentous political constitutional changes happen within the last 20 years. These things can happen and I think we need to be aware that anything could happen, which is why I said at the beginning of the, of the programme, you know, may you live in interesting times. It's not necessarily a good thing. It could be a curse. It could be really, really damaging. So, yeah, all bets are off. I mean, from a sort of now and again, you put your political hat on and you sort of stand back and go, God, this is really interesting. You can imagine what's going to be written about this and in political history, science yeah. classes yeah. and history in the future. Yeah. And then you remember, but I'm actually in the middle You're of all this. It. And, you know, I have a 28-year-old a, a daughter. It's her future mm -hmm. that I'm concerned about. She now lives and works in London and is desperately sorry that she's had to move down there for work because she's getting a completely different narrative from, mm. from what she gets when she comes up to visit. So, yeah, I think, we've, I think we need to be very vigilant and people need to be challenging everything that's coming out of Westminster in the next wee while. And we need some direction from where we think we need to go. And um, I think it's the, the time for reasoned comment is passing. I think it's time we, Nicola needs to get our dander up a wee bit, mm -hmm. I think. Mike Russell, we've seen it happen. Uh, I've seen John Swinney, Swinney lose his rag, but I think we need to see Nicola get our dander up a wee bit. And I think we'd all support her in that. You talked a bit about the, the media um, and I think obviously in terms of language and rhetoric it's really important and if you if you talk about the you know Holyrood being taken away we've already seen for the last wee while this rhetoric of it's another layer of government it costs us this amount of money it's almost as if they've been drip feeding the thought there so is that if it happens, it's there's the justification. Um, and it's similar, I think, in terms of language, because we, we talk about the Irish border. And actually, the, the Irish are very clear, it's the British border in Ireland. Absolutely. You know, and I think we need to be mindful of the language we do. And it's a bit like what you said about um, normalising. Yeah. 
That's what I'm saying. I'd be surprised if there's not been people working away on a scenario for what would happen. What's the risk and what's the mm-hmm. likely damage and what's the likely fallout if we just decided to suspend the Scottish Parliament just even for a wee while? And mm-hmm. um, I, I'm sure that's... And I think that's probably been there for quite a long time. Um, I think that was, you know, they... they they, they tested it with evil. I mean, I will never forget the morning after the referendum. The first words mm-hmm. out of Cameron's mouth after telling us that the Queen had purred was, by the way, we're introducing evil, so you're not getting to vote. Now, SNP were actually fairly honourable about a lot of that and, and did. I don't think abstaining is the right approach for anybody in a parliament. But, you know, if you were doing it for... If you are being honourable and saying, well, it's not something that affects us, so we really shouldn't have a say... Um, but that was that, and that was just, if you like, a shot across the bows. Yeah. And you know what? We didn't really react to that. Mm-hmm. We just kind of went, oh, okay then. So every time they try something and they push something, and they get away with it, or they don't see that there's going to be a massive fallout, they think, okay, we've pushed that envelope a bit further. Um, that's what you do with children, and mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. they're treating us like mm-hmm, children. Mm-hmm. And it, we're, we're going to have to have a, a, a terrible twos time and have a bit of a tantrum, I think. And then there's quite a lot of us are up for that, really. Just you know, get me a barricade and I'll people it tomorrow, sort of thing. <laughs> do you think um, that they underestimate the the knowledge and the interest in politics in Scotland? I mean, ever since the referendum. People, including our young people, have been much more switched on um, about what's going on. And you can see that in social media. I think because they live in that Westminster bubble, I'm not sure they actually appreciate just how switched on people are up here. I think you're right. And I think, will that bite them I, I in the bum? I think they've always known that about Northern Ireland. Um, but they've been able to kind of dismiss that as just a bunch of slightly weird people falling out about, was it religion or was it something else? Mm-hmm. So they've, you know, very dismissive. Um, although living with the consequences. But I do think that they are surprised. I think it surprised them in 2014. I mean, even just the turnout for the actual vote. Um, I think they were very surprised at the very clear message about wanting to stay in Europe that came out of Scotland. And I think you're right. They're, they're, it's, it's what I was saying about treating people as if they're idiots. And that's how they're used to treating people. And they're just... Uh, you know, Scotland is a small country. People talk to each other. In ways that doesn't that don't happen across England, um, you know, you want something done in Scotland. It's not that difficult to sort of lift the phone to the right kind of person, um, and so I think that connectivity of the country, mm-hmm. its small size, is actually part of its power and its dynamic. And you see that in other small European countries. I mean, obviously we're often compared to Norway, but other small European countries have that same attitude and approach, where the citizens are switched on. They do know what's happening because there's not that many of them and they've all got to take a bit of collective responsibility. I mean, you were asking me about, you know, cabinet collective responsibility. There's more collective responsibility in the citizens in Scotland than you've, you, that you mm-hmm. witnessed in number 10 last night. So, yeah, and long may they be surprised at that. But, you know, they have to realise that at some point that has to have some teeth. I think the other thing they underestimate is in terms of how the two separate parliaments work, I think... Westminster is very much a bubble where you it's difficult for you to access people. The MPs and people and ministers and stuff down there seem to be on some kind of pedestal and you don't get access and you have to get, get through staff first. Whereas here, it's much easier to contact and have a meeting. Just an ordinary person with your MP or your MSP. We've got a rural parliament going on down in Stranra just now where we've got government ministers down there. So is it the people that are impacted by rural issues can speak to them one-to-one. I think we're much better at doing that. I think that's absolutely true. The fact that the Cabinet will tour around the country during the summer months in the recess and talk yeah. to people yeah. is also important. Again, it's possibly because of the size of the country. I mean, if, you've, if you're if you in the Scottish Parliament at any point just waiting to be seen by a Minister or, or, a, or a Cabinet Secretary, yeah, you'll be amazed at the number of people, as you say, ordinary people who are just in that waiting area waiting to be seen. And people value that. They appreciate that they can do that, that their elected representatives are not at a distance from them. Um, I mean, I think even the whole committee structure in the Scottish Parliament, I think it's wonderful. The petition structure is wonderful. Laws change as a result of that, and mm-hmm. people feel that they are empowered with that. Um, and I think we're very lucky as well. I think we have a lot of very strong um very public service minded councillors across the country that are doing really, really good work as well. And again, they're very 
open and easy to access. Um, so I think it is very different from the approach. I mean, the whole lobbying idea arises from the fact that, you know, that's the one place in Westminster mm -hmm. where you can stand and maybe get a chance to speak to somebody, somebody, this drafty wee lobby. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right, it's just, it's just, it's they're too distant. And I think because people have to live and stay down there, I mean, I think, you know, you talk about people going native, and I think a lot of people go to Westminster with high ideals that they're not going to be tainted by the system. But we saw with the scandal with MPs' expenses a few mm -hmm. years back, that's exactly what happens. And there's a lot of people go down there and I think quite happily forget their obligations to their voters in other parts of the UK. And it's a nice, cosy system. It's so antiquated. The fact that it doesn't sit till the afternoons, usually, it's very anti-women mm -hmm. in that yeah. uh, approach. Until um, one o'clock in the morning. Exactly. And, and, you know, and that's really so that people can have two jobs basically, mm -hmm. and just its physical setup. The fact that there are not enough seats mm -hmm. in the House of Commons for all the elected exactly. representatives is unheard of. You tell European colleagues that, and they just look at you as if you're nuts. Yeah. But then they say, but your trains are about the same, aren't they? You know, yeah, <laughs> and in yeah. Europe, you usually can't, if there's no seat, you can't board a train. So we're, we're used to having people standing. Um, and I think just the physical shape of the Scottish Parliament is, is it's much more open, as I say, it's, it's much more collegiate, it's not adversarial, yeah. Yeah. it's not you standing behind a ballot box trading insults. Yeah. I mean, you listen to um, Parliament on television and it's a bear pit or worse there's nobody in the damn place mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know uh, so my MP's forever putting up videos of him on his feet and he's on his feet a lot to maybe 12 people and you think that's appalling mm -hmm. that's absolutely ridiculous even today during May's grilling as the BBC called it something <laughs> like a grilling to me actually a bit of light basting perhaps the place was half empty yeah, you yeah. think well, if you can't be bothered to turn up for not. this what on earth are you down there for in the first place? And I think, um, unfortunately, in the television um, in the Westminster Chamber, you don't actually get a sense of the noise that's there because the microphones pick up that one person talking. And although you can hear a drone, it's not till you're in there that you, you understand the actual noise. It's just... And it's and horrific. How, it's like how a, can you... It's like a junior common exactly. room. Exactly. The how can insults... You work? So, you know, there's been insults Shouting about people not, not understanding Scottish and Welsh MPs and making yeah, fun of people's yeah, accents. Yeah. I mean, it's childish, but it's de and that's very much part of that whole very dismissive attitude if you're not in the club, and I think they treat the whole of the country like that. You're not from the southeast of England. Yeah. You're mm. not wealthy. You, you know, you're not a captain of industry. You're not, you know, into dodgy banking deals and offshore accounts, you know. We don't want to know. To know yeah. And Scotland are just, you know, in this faraway place. They don't understand us. They don't want to understand us. They are treating us with contempt. And they've done it for 300 years. It has to stop. Mm -hmm. And we have to be the ones to make it. Because they're not going to change. No. This idea that somehow if there's a general election and there's a new government put in place or the Labour Party are elected, which I don't see happening, by the way, is going to make any difference. Because if anybody is taking the Scottish people for granted for the last 300 years, well, the Labour Party hasn't existed for 300 years, but since their existence, it's the Labour Party. So nothing is going to change. We have to be the people who take control. So, you know, I, during the, the, the campaign, I was saying to people, I don't want to take my country back. I want to take my country forward. But actually, I want to take back some control of what's happening to me and, and you know, my business and my life. And we can't be waiting on somebody in Westminster dishing out the crumbs. So we've tried the compromise. We've tried the reasoned argument. We've now, we're now trying that, but this just isn't fair. And of course, it isn't fair. And they say, so what? So now we have to say, well, you've left us no choice. And I think the people in Scotland will get behind that. I think some reluctantly. Mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting if there's a referendum and we get a yes vote, that everyone who says yes will be dancing and singing about it. But I think people will have to say, do you know what? Enough is enough. The time has come. So now is not the time. Well, actually, now is exactly the time, Teresa, who probably won't be Prime Minister anyway by Monday. So we'll be dealing with somebody else. I wonder who that will be. <laughs> We're talking about contempt, uh, treating Scotland with contempt. The last female Prime Minister very much treated Scotland with contempt. And if you mention Margaret Thatcher's name in Scotland, there's usually a sharp intake of breath. What do you think Theresa's going to go down in history as? Is she worse than Maggie Thatcher? I think she's worse because she's much less 
effective. I mean, Margaret Thatcher was a cold, clinical, extremely intelligent woman. She was very focused. She knew what she wanted. Theresa May hasn't got a clue. She doesn't know what she wants. She blows like the wind. Um, she is trying to please um, everybody and she's pleasing nobody. She's not strong. She's a coward in some respects. I mean, the way that she wouldn't deal with the media, at least Thatcher was quite happy to come mm. out, fists up and take you on. Um, that's not grudging respect, by the way, just in no. case you wondered. So I think um, she will come down as being someone who's done more damage to the whole of the UK than Thatcher did, but with no sense that she was doing it with any great plan in mind. She is a, a she's an absolute puppet, and I think she's held with I mean contempt is the word that I think most of her party use for her. Um, I wonder whether the reason they gave her the job was because she was a woman, they thought she was weak, they thought she was easily manipulated, and she was ultimately disp uh, disposable. So if it all went wrong, well, it would be no great loss. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't remember which famous um, British military captain said that of the Scots, if the Scots fall, it is no great loss. Mm -hmm. So I think there was a bit of that with her, whereas... If at that point maybe Boris Johnson had got the job, they maybe wouldn't want to see mm. him go down the same way. So I think they've regarded her as pretty expendable. And I think a lot of that is... I do think they hold her in a lot of contempt because she is a woman. I mean, Margaret Thatcher is, you know, had no, was not a sister. Uh, there wasn't a feminist bone mm. in her body. She mm. didn't do anything for women as in government. She didn't do anything to bring women into her government. Theresa May is very similar to that extent. Um, and it's that thing that a lot of women in power try to do. They think they have to be more like a man and tougher to succeed. An actual fact, it's the opposite. And Nicola Sturgeon is a classic example mm. of that to some extent. Angela Merkel is a classic example of that. We have women leaders across Europe who are doing decent jobs, who are not held in contempt because they're a woman, who are focused and know what they're doing. So, yeah... I, th I think they'll try to airbrush it out of history, actually. Mm. I hear David Cameron's thinking about coming back into Parliament. I, I laughed when I heard <laughs> that, but I believe... I mean, this is the thing as well, them all resigning and running away. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. stand your ground. Yeah. I mean, David yeah. Cameron's decision to quit was appalling. I felt the same, I have to say, when Alex Salmond stood down. I'm not a particular fan of the man, and I think Nicola's been a much better bet, but it did feel a bit like, oh, I'm, it's my ball and I'm taking it and I'm running away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes you have to just stand your ground. He could have done that at least for a while. Um, and if she goes, she'll be dragged kicking and screaming. Mm -hmm out of the building. So what do you think is going through Theresa May's head at the moment? Is she, I mean, she must be under incredible stress or, or is, is she not? Is she sleeping? What, what is going Well, she doesn't look a well woman and she's not a well woman and she has quite serious health yeah, issues yeah. And, and, and ironically, you know, she's a diabetic and we don't produce any insulin in Britain so yeah. where will you be getting it from if, if, there's, if there's no stockpile? Um, I think she must be, I think there must be a bit of her is probably wishing it would just all go away and she could just walk away from it. I think her life must be misery. Um, for some of the hard Brexiteers, they're loving all of this. They're loving the disarray. They're loving the panic. They're loving the fear because they live on that. Mm. I don't think she's like that. I think she must be wishing the whole thing would go away. So maybe if the letters go in today and there's a vote of no confidence and she loses, she might be actually quite pleased. And that's really my, my final question, Maggie. Do you think she is going to survive this? either today, tomorrow, or next week, is she going to survive? Uh, no, I don't think she will. I don't think she'll go immediately, but I don't think she will survive. The question is, is there a general election? I think there might be, and I think, and I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I think if there's a general election, the Conservatives might get back in. Mm. Um, but whether they still need to rely on the DUP, who knows? That would be a, a great thing if the DUP's um, uh, influence was to wane, because mm. that's been insidious yeah. in every regard. Okay, that's um, all we've got time for. Thank you, Maggie, for coming in this afternoon. I hope you have enjoyed our special Brexit deal report. Um, and if you have a look out for our crowdfunder, um, and you'll, you'll see the link um, down below, if you could maybe um, donate to that, that would be really useful. And thank you to everybody who has so far. And we will see you again on Sunday for the Full Scottish.